It is really hard to believe, but it has been 32 years since Thomas Pickering first uh, described something called white coat hypertension, and yet there is still controversy regarding the extent and implications of white coat hypertension. So the lead paper in the November 8th issue of Jack is the cardiovascular risk of white coat hypertension, and to talk about it, I am with the first author of the paper, with Dr. Stanley S. Franklin, who is clinical professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of California in Irvine. Do you really think Dr. Pickering would have realized that this many years later we would still be having debates over this topic? I don't think so. And uh, uh, Thomas Pickering was a personal friend of mine. And I, I would have been delighted to present him with the data uh, that we have shown in our recent Jack publication. Wouldn't it also be good to have a good definition of white coat hypertension <laughs> after 32 years? Absolutely. Well, actually, we, we need to make a distinction between white coat effect and white coat hypertension. They're not the same. They're not the same. White coat effect is the rise in blood pressure in a medical environment, regardless of the daytime ambulatory blood pressure monitor value, whether you, your uh, subject is taking antihypertensive treatment or not. Okay. Now, the definition of white coat hypertension, it exists if the office blood pressure is high, and we use the cutoff of equal to or greater than 140, equal to or greater than 90 systolic and diastolic blood pressure, and the awake 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure is less than 135, less than 85 millimeters of mercury in the absence of antihypertensive therapy. So there needs to be at least five uh, millimeters of mercury difference between both. Right. Okay. Now here, now let me just say one more very important yes. thing. And this is not new to our study, but we confirmed it. And that is that the size of the white coat effect increases with aging very dramatically. And similarly, the incidence of white coat hypertension increases with aging. So th these are very important points because they, ha they have uh, a direct implication on our findings. Okay, so what do we know? Before we get to what's new, what bef before your study, what did we think we knew? There was a great deal of confusion in the literature. Would you believe it? Almost 3,000 publications, including white coat effect and white coat hypertension. And you can imagine with that, that many publications, there had to be confusion. Yeah, yeah. That's the definition, I think, for setting up confusion. So this is a really big analysis. And how did it, this come about, first of all? How did you end up as first author of of this publication? Well, first of all, uh, the IDACO study, and let me define it, uh, what the IDACO means. Uh, it's the uh, International Database on Ambulatory Blood Pressure in Relation to Cardiovascular Outcome Investigators, uh, abbreviated IDACO, IDACO. Okay. And I was very fortunate uh, to be a good friend of the director of the study, Jan Stassen, mm -hmm. located in Leuven, Belgium. And uh, he invited me, even though I had nothing to do with collecting the data, to try to analyze the data and see if I could come up uh, with um, a significant uh, improvement in the uh, interpretation because so many past studies have been confused that's why the confusion exists. So you were the fresh eyes to look at the data? In a sense, that's true. And the fresh eyes frequently can see things that the, true. <laughs> that the people who have collected the data uh, cannot. So well, after 32 uh, years, some fresh eyes would probably be a good idea. So yes. what did you find? What does the study find? Well, before I even give you the results, the two stumbling blocks to interpreting the data were number one, comparing it to a normal tensive control population. In order to do the proper uh, 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 assessment, co comparison of white coat hypertension with uh, the normal tensive controls, you have to age 
uh, control, you cannot just adjust. It has to be okay. a separation of the two studies. This is the number one problem in making the comparison between white coat hypertension and cardiovascular risk because invariably people with white coat hypertension will be older than the mean age of the normal tensive controls and that will by itself increase the risk. Right, skew the results. Yes. The second thing we did is uh, define cardiovascular risk into two groups, low and high. Uh, and we used the, uh, uh, the European Society classification of doing that. So the high risk would be three or more risk factors or diabetes uh, or a combination of diabetes and prior complications. So what is new? When you took a look at all this data that they had accumulated, what did you conclude? We concluded that there was some uh, heterogeneity uh, in the study, but that uh, in the uh, population of white coat hypertension, 653, which is the largest grouping of white coat hypertension in the literature, untreated, and with a 10.6 year follow-up for cardiovascular events. Uh, again, this is about, uh, about the longest yeah. uh, follow-up uh, in the literature. We concluded that 96.6% of these individuals had a benign course which was no different from the normal tensive controls that were age matched, not adjusted, but age matched. So this is really quite different from some of the studies that have raised this as a, as a, as a health issue. It's a health issue, but it's, it's how you define health. Because the normal tensive control population, uh, you want to be at your highest health level. Right. So how do, you, how do you define that? Number one, you make sure that uh, they're not receiving treatment because uh, if physicians have them on treatment, they assume that they have higher risk. You have to re remove an entity called uh, <coughs> mast hypertension, Correct. which ex exists in the normal tensive population if you're not careful to exclude them. Uh, and so how you define your, your normal tensive population really is uh, extremely important in, in how you assess the risk of persons with white coat hypertension. Now, uh, this is no surprise to you, I'm sure, but this is going to be controversial. I think the results that you have here uh, are probably going to lead to some debate themselves. How confident are you with the data that you review, reviewed and now is published in the November 8th issue of Jack? We had th three potential theories to explain our data. Theory one is that there is no relationship whatsoever with cardiovascular risk and white coat hypertension. We excluded that. There was heterogeneity. Theory number two is that there is an intrinsic relationship with white coat hypertension and cardiovascular risk. We excluded that because, number one, only a very small percentage of subjects had risk, and two, they were only found in the very elderly, and those very elderly who had extreme uh, risk factors for cardiovascular uh, events. So we came to the third conclusion, is that there was an extrinsic relationship. We had to come to that conclusion because when we uh, looked at, uh, at our population and divided them by age under 60 and age over 60, and whether they had low risk or high risk, we found that indeed those very elderly people over the age of 60 
uh, who had high risk uh, did have uh, approximately a two-fold increase in uh, events over the 10-point six-year follow-up as those individuals with low risk. Uh, but because uh, this, we used the definition extrinsic rather than intrinsic, we had to come up with a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is in the paper at the end with a Venn diagram, which shows the interaction between white coat effect, white coat hypertension, and isolated systolic hypertension, which you can diagnose by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And you separate it from those that are hypertensive, from those that are high normal, which would be in the so-called normal group. Right. The problem with a single 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure is that you can't pick them, pick, you can't separate those two groups 100%. Well, I think in the study, there was, most patients had at least 10 different blood pressure readings, did they not? Uh, well, that's, that's another question. The 24-hour the, uh, monitor had a minimum of 10, okay. but uh, the mean was uh, 28. Wow. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, several investigators, including the investigator who wrote the editorial uh, many years ago, uh, decided that uh, 10 would be enough. No, the point is that we had plenty of power to do a good 24-hour monitor, and it fit the uh, it fit the uh, guidelines of the International Society that uh, defines guidelines for doing the 24-hour ambulatory. So we were well within that limit. Uh, there were a few with 10, but that was just a small percentage of... Uh, that was like the bare minimum. Yeah. Right? Right. So the editorial comment is by uh, Mancia and Grassi, and they also emphasize the heterogeneous nature of white coat hypertension. So. What's the take-home message? What do you want people to walk away once they read this paper in the, in the uh, November 8th issue of Jack? Uh, the number one point is that <laughs> this, the largest study, the longest uh, follow-up for cardiovascular events, determined that 96.6% of the uh, 653 white coat hypertensive subjects were at no greater risk than the normal tensive controls that were age matched. Uh, but the other point, the heterogeneity, uh, was found in such a small group of elderly people that we hypothesized, and we don't have the proof, but the data seemed to uh, fit very nicely, that these people who did have uh, these events, a twofold increase, the very elderly people with high cardiovascular risk, were indeed not white coat hypertensive, but they were isolated systolic hypertensive masquerading as white, white coat hypertension, hypertension because they had a high white coat effect. Right. That is fascinating. And, and please take a look at the paper. It is the lead-off paper in the uh, November 8th issue of Jack, The Cardiovascular Risk of White Coat Hypertension. And please look around for our coverage from the American Heart Association, where uh, I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.